So, so it's my great pleasure to be here. I will not touch too much on neutrinos, but uh, you will see how gravitational waves can be complementary. Uh, I'm sorry for the uh, summer day that you are experiencing today, but I think it should be better. Uh, this is, by the way, you see here in the uh, cover slide, uh, this is uh, taken from the Louisiana Museum, which is outside of the city. If you have time, I really uh, recommend you uh, going there. So, right. Uh, so in this talk, just to set the stage, we are going to be talking briefly about uh, gravitational waves. Is the sound okay? Yeah. Perfect. Yes. So probably you all know, but just to remind you that the sources that we are seeing with gravitational waves, these are a, a black holes and neutron stars of uh, several solar masses. These are objects that are orbiting around each other until they emerge. Uh, and while they do it, they acquire velocities close to the speed of light. So these are highly relativistic uh, systems uh, that evolve in, the, uh, in a very uh, strong gravity regime, producing a gravitational waves that uh, travel across the universe. Uh, this is something that uh, in our group, uh, the strong group, uh, we uh, try to deal with how to understand fundamental physics and cosmology uh, with these uh, signals. Now, uh, for the particular topic of my research, I try to uh, use these gravitational waves to learn about cosmology. But of course, uh, there's plenty that we know already about cosmology. I'm sure in the lectures about neutrino cosmology, many of these uh, uh, concepts will be brought up. But of course, we know uh, uh, a lot from the CMB, the cosmic microwave background, uh, that set us the initial conditions uh, for our cosmological model, but also we have observations of the large scale structure that we can compare with uh, uh, embodied simulations. And we also see, uh, we can see like luminous matter through galaxies, but we can also see uh, how the dark matter distribution uh, in the universe uh, is uh, located through lensing of electromagnetic signals. All of this. Uh, help us to build this model, which is now a stand, what we call the standard cosmological model that helps explain 13.8 uh, billion years of, of cosmic evolution. Uh, this is a remarkable success, uh, which is based on very few ingredients. So building up on general relativity, the theory that describes gravity, the cosmological principle, and then a few, of in, 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 a few ingredients like dark energy, dark matter, radiation, etc. we can build this model uh, that describes uh, all of the cosmic history. But as you all know, uh, this model also uh, does not provide us with fundamental answers about its components. So we observe that the universe is expanding every time faster, uh, but we don't know why. Wh what is the fundamental nature of that. We see that galaxies evolve from this very universe galaxies form uh, through the evolution of these perturbations in a very homogeneous initial universe that through gravity they collapse and they form these galaxies but we know there must be some dark matter but we we can uh, we don't know the uh, fundamental nature of, 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 of that and also as I was emphasizing in the previous slide all this model stands on the assumption that uh, our theory of gravity that we have tested in our laboratories in our solar system holes at uh, large scales. So these are the kind of things that the kind of basic questions that many people in cosmology are trying to answer. And we, from gravitational wave astronomy community, we are also trying to give uh, a new perspective. And to understand that, I like to show this plot that uh, represents uh, the distribution of mergers of binary black holes across cosmic time. So what you are seeing here is that we are in the center of this plot, and then the radi radial direction is just the age of the universe. This is a simulated uh, model, uh, as taking some assumption about the astrophysical formation of this black hole, but that's not relevant to us. Uh, what is uh, relevant is that uh, uh, mergers of binary black holes occur across cosmic time. And what is important is that when we think of how far we can detect these signals with our current observatories. Uh, uh, you, you see that at the moment, we this is the blue dust line, we can detect signals with, uh, with uh, up to a few 
a billion years back in time. Uh, but in the uh, with current detectors technology, uh, we are gonna uh, get to close to 10 billion years back in time. And more impressively, in the next generation of detectors, in the next decade, we are gonna be able to detect all these uh, binary black hole mergers that occur across cosmic time. And this is very important when you are thinking uh, of understanding uh, cosmology because uh, the, uh, the components uh, that build up this uh, standard cosmological model also evolve across cosmic time. So at the moment, uh, we are dominated by dark energy, but when you look back on time, that matter uh, was a larger portion of the, uh, of the cosmic pie, et cetera, et cetera. So with uh, gravitational waves, we are gonna have a very direct way of probing the universe uh, in uh, the distant past where the components were different. So this will allow us to uh, get hopefully a uh, deep understanding about the evolution of the universe. Now, something which is important to emphasize about gravitational waves is that uh, they are very different from other transients in that we know how this signal that I was showing before, uh, we know this from first principles. So general relativity, no worries, hope everything is fine. So general relativity uh, predicts uh, how this uh, signal uh, emitted from a compact binary coalescence should look like. Uh, and then what this means is that we have a template that we can look, uh, we can use to look for signals. And this makes uh, gravitational waves a standard silence because then uh, we, we know that the only thing that will kind of, I mean, simplifying, but the thing that will uh, change the amplitude of this uh, template will only be the distance. Moreover, uh, gravitational waves uh, interact very weakly. And that's something which is, I guess, uh, similar to neutrinos, but even more weakly in the sense that they can really uh, uh, transverse any uh, structure in the universe. And that's very good uh, when you want to uh, see how was the, to, to, you, you want to reconstruct the conditions of the universe when this, when this signal was emitted. Uh, and moreover, as you have seen in the previous uh, panel, these signals uh, 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 merge at cosmological distances. So intrinsically, these are all uh, very good uh, for doing cosmology. So uh, in simple terms, you ha we have like these black holes that collide, they emit uh, a gravitational wave. And as this gravitational wave travels across the universe, what is gonna happen is that its amplitude is gonna decay just because it's a spherical wave and the amplitude decays inversely with the distance, but also it is gonna get stretched just because uh, the universe is expanding and uh, waves get redshifted. So from the amplitude of the gravitational wave, uh, we, we have uh, direct uh, information on the distance. That's, uh, that's, all, that's as I was saying in the previous slide, that's something very unique of gravitational wave that we have an absolute measure of the distance. Uh, and then the mass of the gravitational wave, we can get it from the uh, frequency evolution of the signal. So the chirping the, the, of the signal, that uh, how the frequency increases with time uh, is proportional to the uh, mass of the, of the binary. So in fact, in, in, in reality, more or less how this works is that from the frequency evolution, you get the mass, and then when you plug in the mass, you can get the distance. So both things uh, come together. So our basic observables uh, are the luminosity distance and then the detector frame masses. And here I emphasize the detector frame masses because uh, as I was saying, the signal is stretched by the redshift. So we are never uh, gonna, we are never sensitive directly to the masses in the source, in, in, in the mass of the binary, but the masses, how the, the effect of the masses when they are being stretched by the expansion. So if you want to do uh, cosmology, uh, then uh, what you can do very directly is simply uh, focus on the luminosity distance, because that's, uh, if you know the luminosity distance uh, and you have some time in information, then you can do cosmology because you can uh, uh, constrain the expansion rate. For us, all the difficulties comes uh, in getting this time in information. So with gravitational wave, we don't have information, direct information of the red shift, and the whole uh, business of doing cosmology 
is trying to find uh, different ways in which you can get this information. Uh, the most direct one, for, of, of course, is if you see the signal also with electromagnetic radiation, because then you can uh, locate the source in a host galaxy that you might have a spectra, and then you can get the red seed from there. Uh, this is the case of uh, the binary neutron star 17 that uh, I'm sure you all know about it. But uh, there are other systems, for example, if binary black holes were to form in a, a active galactic nuclei, because they are merging in some environment, this might uh, give uh, some electromagnetic signal that we could also look for. In general, uh, the limitations of looking for direct counterparts is that you need to have, as I'm emphasizing, some matter in the system, either in the form of neutron stars or uh, because of the environment. Uh, and as we, uh, uh, as, 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 as we will see a bit later, but uh, our range, the, how far we can detect these binary neutron stars is much nearby than binary black holes. So that's something that limits also uh, this bright side method to relatively nearby signals. Now, also, uh, I should have said it at the beginning, but let me just emphasize this here. The fourth observing run is uh, ongoing. So we have uh, plenty of uh, uh, candidates already. Uh, and of course, like astronomers are actively looking uh, for a uh, counterpart. So it might be that in this fourth observing run, uh, we have new uh, candidates for, uh, uh, for, for multi-messenger events. Something to mention that I should have said as well is that when, when you look at the slide, uh, the PDF version, I try to put links uh, wherever I, I have references. So for example, if you click here in GraceDB, you will be able to go to this page and the same for the other references. Now, even if you don't de detect directly uh, the counterpart, uh, you also know uh, from the gravitational wave detection itself, more or less the region of the sky where the signal is coming from, and also you have some error in the luminosity distance. So this gives you at the end a volume in which you, you think your signal should be. So what you can do is you can go uh, to, uh, to, uh, to you can talk with your colleagues that have been doing galaxy surveys and look at the catalogs of galaxies that they have. And if they cover the same region of the sky and if they cover the same distance, you can uh, associate your gravitational wave event to, uh, a, a, to galaxies within that catalog. And in that way, you can statistically infer uh, the red shift of the source. This is uh, a method that works well when you have good localization. Because if, imagine if you have a very large region of the sky, you will have millions of galaxies, and then your statistical power is very small. But if you have an event, for example, like 17 or 14, that was relatively well constrained, then it might be that there are not that not so many galaxies uh, in that uh, catalog, and then you can infer uh, the Red Sea statistically. Something to remember uh, from this dark side method is that uh, also uh, something which is fundamental is that you need to understand well the completeness of your catalog. So uh, it's not, uh, you, if you don't understand the completeness of your catalog, you can bias uh, your measurement. So that's, so that's, a, that's an important point. Okay, so the last uh, method that I, I wanted to highlight of how you can ob uh, obtain recipe information is that uh, gravitational waves themselves, individually, they don't, they don't include recipe information, but when you uh, study them collectively, there are ways in which you can uh, uh, get some information. Uh, and this is uh, schematically what I'm gonna, uh, what we call a spectral silence. And the basic idea it goes as follows. So at the end, our detectors are getting signals. Uh, we are counting the number of signals at diff with different masses uh, at different distances. So this could be uh, uh, locally, the, for the, uh, uh, let's say, uh, distances closer than uh, uh, 100 megaparsecs, you are counting how many events you get and you make a histogram. Now, this is the distribution of your detector frame masses. And as you remember, and you can see in the top, your detector frame masses are proportional to the red sea. So if you 
Uh, let me just pass with this. If you uh, look uh, at how the distribution of events looks at different luminosity distance, what is simply going to happen is that all your uh, masses are going to move to higher values just because they have been redshifted farther away. So if you uh, identify some features in your mass distribution, for example, some peaks or some points in which uh, the, uh, the, the mass distribution changes, then you can follow how those change as a function of, of, of distance, and this will give you information of the red seed. So the, sorry, the, the mass gets blue shifted, so it becomes more massive the further away. Exactly. Is. Yes. So that is because the yeah the frequency. Uh, yes. Yeah. So exactly. Exactly. Okay. So, yes. So for example, uh, it's it's just a matter of like the. Uh, it's not that I would now observe something which is a redshifted mass for M over one plus that, so M being the original mass. Sorry, what? No. The, so what, what you, uh, so the, the, the masses that you detect are always higher than the source masses. And that's because the expansion is uh, uh, making the, the waves, uh, the wavelength larger or the frequency uh, smaller. So the frequency goes inversely to the, so the more, the more massive the binary is, the lower the frequency is. Yeah, so it, it goes the other way around. Uh, but then what happens here is that, for example, if you were to change some of your cosmological parameters as H0, then what will happen is that you will move all your, uh, um, masses will evolve uh, a bit faster. And for example, if you change the amount of uh, uh, that matter, then they will move uh, a bit lower. Of course, uh, for this method to work, it's important that you understand uh, and you study collectively the, uh, uh, collectively the astrophysical uh, properties of the population as well as the cosmological parameters. And this is something that can be done for uh, or binary neutron stars, binary black holes, uh, or in, in fact, everything together. And there's been many works in the literature uh, doing this. Uh, I will not go into, into details. Uh, so just to uh, let me flash uh, some of the results that have been uh, obtained so far uh, in how we can uh, test our cosmological model. Ah, uh, but I guess before that, I've mentioned already some of the basic questions that we want to understand, like the cosmic acceleration related to dark energy, the validity of general relativity at cosmological scales, but also something which uh, people care a lot about is uh, the discrepancy that is being observed in the value of the locus expansion rate uh, from measurements of uh, uh, the local universe compared to the, what you infer from the measurements of the cosmic microwave background. So let's see uh, quickly which results uh, you can get. So our uh, signal is merging, it's evolving as a function of uh, distance, and then uh, our expansion rate encodes information about the different cosmological parameters, and this comes directly into our luminosity distance. So this is because gravitational waves are direct, directly sensitive to a luminosity distance. This is why we can uh, get information of the expansion rate. So just to set the stage also, uh, we are now uh, uh, at a moment in which we have, uh, we, feel we have completed three observing runs uh, in which we detected about a hundred events. Most of them uh, were in relatively nearby universe with red seas below, below 0.5. We are already in the beginning of 04, uh, that uh, in fact, a two months ago, this started, uh, and this is gonna transition to uh, uh, then the design sensitivity of current detectors in which we will get thousands of events per year, uh, most, well, some of them with red sea larger than one. 
But as I was highlighting at the beginning, uh, the real uh, revolution will come with the next generation detectors and we will get hundreds of thousands of events per year, with most of them being detected uh, at, at larger than 31. So in this plot, by the way, so on the left, this is the number of gravitational wave events as a function of time. And here, what you see is the horizon redshift, which is how far you can detect these signals as a function of the total mass of the binary. So this is also what I was saying before, that when you have a low, a, a small masses, you can detect signal only nearby. And then the maximum uh, distance that we can detect for current detectors is more or less between 100 and 200 solar masses. And then there is the other uh, plan gravitational wave detector from space, LISA, that will detect signals which are much more massive uh, at lower frequencies. So uh, with a, it's fine. I can start with that. Yeah, that's the wrong. I think that's the question. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah. So could you maybe explain why it's, it seems as though for all of these detectors, it's the, you can detect the higher mass things further away, but then there comes like a drop off point. Yes. Um, oh yeah, I'll say that again. So it seems as though with all of these detectors, uh, there's like a monotone relation between uh, how far away something is uh, that you can detect it and how massive it is. Uh, but then there's a drop off point for all of them. Uh, so, how does that come up? Because I don't see any. Yes, so that, that, yeah, that's an excellent point. So, this is the a low frequency limit of the sensitivity. So the, the detect, so for current uh, ground-based detectors, these come mostly from seismic noise. Uh, and what this means is that uh, if you have uh, signals which has yeah, very low frequency, that will be very massive, they are outside of your sensitivity band. So it, it, it is just that. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on the other hand, Lisa, because it is in a space and it has a much larger uh, arm length, uh, it will be able to detect signals which are uh, has higher masses, although of course also in Lisa at some point this drops down uh, and goes here. And I should have, although I mean this is not direct uh, detection, but uh, pulsar time in arrays, which also are kind of have recently some evidence for gravitational waves, this would be like masses, kind of like large. I think. So it's a bit different. Are there more questions? Okay, well, so I, I think just I, I want to emphasize that with uh, current detectors, uh, I guess one of the big targets is using binary neutron stars and bright sirens to constrain uh, the Hubble uh, parameter. Uh, but the big question is whether this will be enough to solve the Hubble tension or not. Uh, and then I think what to me is more uh, exciting is that with the next generation of detectors, with all these hundreds of thousands or even millions of events that we will be able to constrain the expansion rate uh, at higher energy. So, uh, and then, well, I guess, yeah, this is just emphasizing what I, I already said, that with current detectors, we are mostly sensitive to, I mean, when we think of how far we can detect signals, we are mostly sensitive to binary black holes uh, of 50 solar masses or so. And those are our prime sources if we want to do cosmology. So this is uh, the result for the, uh, the multi-messenger event that we had so far, 17.0.17, and this is the constraint of the expansion rate. Uh, and lo the local expansion rate is not. Uh, as you can see, of course, the, the uh, errors are pretty large when you compare uh, with uh, local measurements and also uh, inference from the, from the CMB. But the hope is that uh, with many uh, of these events, uh, for example, I think with 15 already, you can uh, reduce the errors to a uh, few percent. And then if you have uh, several dozens of events, you could reach uh, uh, near uh, the percent level. Now, these predictions that I uh, put here for the rate of uh, binary interest stars in 04, I think uh, are correct, but then uh, they unfortunately are the 
rate of multi-messenger events, these are a bit uh, optimistic because unfortunately Virgo <laughs> was not able to join the port of serving run, uh, at least for the first part. And then that means that our localizations are not as good uh, as we expected. But I think uh, certainly within uh, the next few years, we will get to something close to this number. But then the question is whether this will be useful or not. With a dark science, uh, there's been already uh, a, many, many papers that have looked at the combined inference. And I think what is interesting is that when you combine, these are the best eight or 10 events, uh, the best localized events in, the, in our catalogs, you can get a, a constraint. This is the blue uh, that is not much worse than 17 or 17. So that's also maybe a promising avenue if we collect more of these well-localized events, although again, without Virgo, it's a bit uh, complicated. Now, the final uh, point that I want to, to emphasize is that when we do this population analysis, uh, we are not limited by, uh, by the uh, multi-messenger events. Uh, and then with the, given, with the current population uh, of binary black holes, uh, in uh, at the same sensitivity, one could get constraints on the expansion rate at red shift of around 0.7, better than 10%. So this is, uh, uh, I think this is exciting because this is also a, 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 a period of the universe that is uh, has been is being explored with other cosmological probes like baryon acoustic oscillations. So that's that's interesting. But I guess what is more exciting is that in the with the future detectors, even in one month, one could get constraints on the expansion rate better than 1% uh, 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 at red shift higher than one. And that I think is something which is uh, very interesting. So I have many more slides, but I think I'm already out of time. So I think uh, I just want to uh, say before taking more questions that uh, not only with uh, this type of standard silent analysis, you can constrain the cosmological parameters, but you can also test the foundations of uh, general relativity. For example, testing if the gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, if the luminosity distance uh, scales as it is predicted by general relativity, and many other, uh, many other probes. Uh, but I think it's best if, uh, to take questions if, if there are more, uh, and thank you for your attention. We'll see. Yeah. Other questions? Well, uh, I'm not familiar with uh, spectral time. Um, but I was wondering if you could explain the difference between dark and bright than iron. Yes. So bright silence is essentially means when you have uh, an event in which you have been able to localize the host galaxy with a direct electromagnetic counterpart. For the dark side, end, you don't have a direct electromagnetic counterpart, but you statistically get information about the uh, red shift just because you are saying that your gravitational waves must come from one of the galaxies in a catalog. So you don't have a direct confirmation, but you have a catalog that is covering that region and you say, okay, it must come from there. So that's the, a bit the difference. On your slide, yes. Yes, that's a very good question. So that's because the the merger rate, uh, so the number of black holes that merge as a function of uh, red shift also changes with. So the, the number of merges as a function of red shift changes. So uh, and also the sensitivity of our detectors. Uh, uh, changes as a function of red shift. So this is the point in which you get most binary. So this is essentially telling you that at red shift of 0.7 is the point, is the red shift where you get more binary black holes in your detectors. Now you can see that this moves away to higher red shift, and that is because with next generation detectors, uh, you're essentially sensitive to all the binary black holes in the, in the, in the history, and then uh, this is, by the way, this is a forecast. So this is simulated events. And in this simulation, 
uh, I was thinking that the binary black holes follow the star formation rate, and the star formation rate peaks around uh, 1.5 or so. So this, uh, yeah, this was a very good question. It's, it's a combination of the population that you are inferring and also the sensitivity of the other papers. Any other questions? Okay. I was wondering if you, if you had like the perfect detector that detects the waveform, <laughs> how many large information can you leave up this? Uh, would, would it also be possible to measure the luminosity distance? Yeah, I mean, so if, if so, currently the essentially the errors that we have in the luminosity distance are of about ten percent, and this is uh, in fact mostly coming from the genesis between the distance and the inclination of the binary. Mm -hmm. So as if you were to have a very loud signal or a very good detector, then what will happen is that you will be able to pin down the, the inclination of the binary because you also will be able to get better information on the polarizations. And with that, you will reduce a lot the error in the luminosity distance. Mm -hmm. So that's something that uh, with uh, also with, I mean, as, as the network of Gravitational wave detectors enlarge is something that uh, uh, it, it, it will be done better for sure. Uh, yeah, but then, yeah, well, I, I will let it go. <laughs> right. So, so from the, the frequency development and the, uh, the strain you get there, you can then the velocity and, and the uh, mass. Yeah, and then, yeah, I, I simplify, of course, the, yeah. the picture here, but that in general, our waveform models have 15 parameters. Uh, some which are extrinsic as the position in the sky, but then but you have many which are intrinsic, like the two masses, six spins, and uh, uh, distance. Uh, so all of these parameters like affect the waveform how it looks, and we do a parameter estimation of, of all of all of them. The the formulas that I was showing is the analytical approximation at leading order in the spiral. Any other questions? Okay, let's uh, thank Jose again. Great. Thank you. Thank you.